Section 28 of Canada, The Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, The Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1756 to 1763, Part 3. Cleaning guns and eating snatches of food, Montcalm's men slept that night in their places behind the logs. Montcalm had passed from man to man, personally thanking the troops for their valor. When daylight came over the hills with wisps of fog-like cloud banners from the mountain tops, and the sunlight pouring gold mist through the valley, the French rose and rubbed their eyes. They could scarcely believe it. Sure Abercrombie would come back with his heavy guns. Like the mists of the morning, the English had vanished. Far down the lake they were retreating, in such panic terror they had left their baggage. Places were found on the portage by French scouts, where the English had fled in such haste, marchers had lost their boots in the mud and not stopped to find them. Such was the Battle of Carillon or Ticaconda, good reason for Amherst refusing to go on to Quebec. The year closed with two more victories for the English. Brigadier John Forbes and Washington succeeded in cutting their way up to Fort Duquesnes by a new road. They found the fort abandoned, and taking possession in November, renamed it Pittsburgh, after the great English statesman. The other victory was at Frontenac, or Kingston. As the French had concentrated at Lake Champlain, leaving Frontenac unguarded, Bradstreet gained permission from Abercrombie to lead 3,000 men across Lake Ontario against La Salle's old fur post. Crossing from the ruins of Old Oswego, Bradstreet encamped beneath the palisades of Frontenac on the evening of August the 25th. By morning he had his cannons in range for the walls. Inside the fort, Commandant de Noyen had less than 100 men. At seven in the evening of August 27th, he surrendered. Bradstreet permitted the prisoners to go down to Montreal on parole to be exchanged for the English prisoners held in Quebec. Furs to the value of eighty thousand dollars, twenty cannon, and nine vessels were captured. Bradstreet divided the loot among his men, taking for himself not so much as a penny's worth. The fort was destroyed. So were the vessels. The guns and provisions were carried across the lake and deposited at Fort Stanwix east of Old Oswego. The loss of Duquesnes on the Ohio and Fort Frontenac on Lake Ontario cut French dominion in America in two. Henceforth, there was no highway from New France to Louisiana. In September, Abercrombie was recalled. Amherst became chief commander. Wolfe had gone home to England ill. It was while sojourning at the fashion resort, Bath, that he fell desperately in love with a Miss Lothar, to whom he became engaged. Then came the summons from Pitt to meet the cabinet ministers in the War Office of London. Wolfe was asked to take command of the campaign in 1759 against Quebec. It had been his ambition in Louisbourg to proceed at once against Quebec. Here was his opportunity. It need not be told. He told it. Amherst now, on the field south of Lake Champlain, received ten pounds a day as commander-in-chief. For the greater task of reducing Quebec, Wolfe was to receive two pounds a day. Under him were to serve Moncton, Townshend, and Murray, Admiral Sanders was to command the fleet. Wolfe advised sending a few ships beforehand to guard the entrance to the St. Lawrence, and Durrell was dispatched for this purpose 
long before the main armaments set out. By April 30th, the combined fleet and army were at Halifax. Wolfe was a force of some 8,500 men. Wolfe, now only in his 33rd year, had been the subject of such jealousy that he was actually compelled to sail from Louisbourg in June without one penny of ready money in his army chest. Underling officers, whose duty it was to advance him money on credit, had raised difficulties. Cheers and cheers yet again rent the air as the fleet at last set out for the St. Lawrence. The soldiers on deck shouting themselves hoarse as Louisbourg faded over the watery horizon. The officers at table the first night out at sea, drinking toast after toast to British colors on every French fort in America. At Quebec was fast and furious preparation for the coming siege. Bougainville had been sent to France from Lake Champlain in 1758 with report of the victory at Titicondra. In vain he appealed for more money, more men for the coming conflict. The French government sent him back to Quebec with a bundle of advice, and platitudes and titles and badges and promotions and soft words, but of the sinew which makes war, men and money, France had not to spare. The rumor of the English invasion was confirmed by Bougainville. Every man capable of bearing arms was called to Quebec except the small forces at the outposts, and Berlin Mac at Champlain was instructed, if attacked by Amherst, to blow up Fort Carillon, then Crown Point, and retire. Grain was gathered into the state warehouses, and so stripped of able-bodied men were the rural districts that the crops of 1759 were planted by the women and children. Fire ships and rafts were constructed, the channel of St. Charles River closed by sinking vessels, and a bridge built higher up to lead from Quebec City across the river eastward to Beauport and Montmercy. Along the high cliffs of the St. Lawrence, from Montmercy Falls to Quebec, were constructed earthworks and entrenchments to command the approach up the river. What frigates had come in with Bougainville were sent higher up the St. Lawrence to be out of danger, but the crews, numbering 1,400, were posted on the ramparts of Upper Town. Counting mere boys, Quebec had a defensive force variously given as from 9,000 to 14,000 but deducting raw levies, who scarcely knew the rules of the drill room, it is doubtful if Montcalm could boast of more than 5,000 able-bodied fighters. Still he felt secure in the impregnable strength of Quebec's natural position. July 29th, when the enemy lay encamped beneath its trenches, he could write, unless they, the English, have wings, they cannot cross a river and effect a landing and scale a precipice. One cruel feature there was of Quebec's preparations. To keep the habitants on both sides of the river loyal, Vaudreuil, the governor, issued a proclamation telling the people that the English intended to massacre the inhabitants, men, women, and children. Meanwhile, morning, noon, and night, the chapel bells are ringing, ringing, lilting, and calling the faithful to prayers for the destruction of the heretic invader. Nuns lie prostrate day and night in prayer for the colony's deliverance from the English. Holy processions march through the streets. Nuns and priests and little children in white and rough solidary in uniforms with the blue facings to pray heaven's aid for victory and while the poor people starve for bread, poultry is daily fattened on precious wheat that it may make tenderest meat for intendant's bigot's table, where the painted women and drunken gamblers and gay officers nightly feast. 
Signal fires light up the hills with ominous warning as the English fleet glides slowly abreast the current of the St. Lawrence, now pausing to sound where the yellow rifle of the current shows shallows, now following the course staked out by flags, here depending on the Frenchmen, whom they have compelled to act as pilot. Nightly from hill to hill the signal fires leap to the sky till one flames from the Cape Torment, and Quebec learns that the English are surely very near. Among the Englishmen who are out in the advance boat sounding is a young man, James Cook, destined to become a great navigator. June 25th, sail after sail, frigate after frigate, bristling with cannon, literally swarming with soldiers and marines, glide round the ends of Orleans Island, through driving rain and a squall, and to clatter of anchor chains and rattle of falling sails, come to rest. Pray heaven they be wrecked, as Sir Hovenden Walker's fleet was wrecked long ago, sighs the nuns of Quebec. If they have prayed half as hard as their corrupt rulers, their bigots and their kings and their painted women whose nod could set Europe on fire with war. If the Holy Sisterhood had prayed for this gang of vampires whose vices had brought doom to the land to be swallowed in some abyss, their prayers might have been more effective with heaven. Next day a band of rangers lands from wolf's ships and finds the island of Orleans deserted. On the church door the curé has pinned a note, asking the English not to molest his church, and expressing sardonic regret that the invaders have not come soon enough to enjoy the fresh vegetables of his garden. Wolf for the first time gazes on the prize of his highest ambition, Quebec. He is at Orleans, facing the city. To his right is the cataract of Montmorency, from the falls past Beauport to St. Charles River. The St. Lawrence banks are high cliffs. Above the cliffs are Montcalm's entrenched fighters. Then the north shore of the St. Lawrence suddenly shears up beyond St. Charles River into a lofty, steep precipice. The precipice is Quebec City, Upper Town and the convents and the ramparts and Castle St. Louis nestling on an upper ledge of the rock below Cape Diamond, Lower Town crowding between the foot of the precipice and tidewater. Look again how the St. Lawrence turns in a sharp angle at the precipice. Three sides of the city are water. St. Charles River nearest Wolf, then the St. Lawrence across the steep face of the rock, then the St. Lawrence again along a still steeper precipice to the far side. Only the rear of the city is vulnerable, but it is walled and inaccessible. Quebec was a prize for any commander's ambition, but how to win it? The night of June 28th is calm, warm, pitch dark, the kind of summer night when the velvet heat touches you as with a hand. The English soldiers of the crowded transports have gone ashore, when suddenly out of the darkness glide fire ships as from an underworld, with flaming mast poles and hulls in shadow roaring with fire, throwing out combustibles drifting straight down on the tide towards the English fleet. But the French have managed badly. They have set the ships on fire too soon. The air is torn to tatters by terrific explosions that light up the outlines of the city spires and churn the river to billows. Then the English sailors are out in small boats, avoiding the suck of the undertow throwing out grappling hooks they tow the flaming fire rafts away from their fleet it is the first play of the game and the french have lost monkton goes ashore on point levy side next day 
Townsend has landed his troops east of the Montmorency on the north shore. It is the second play of the game, and Wolfe has violated every rule of war, for he has separated his forces in three divisions close to a powerful enemy. He is counting on Montcalm's policy, however, and Montcalm's play is to lie inactive, sleeping in his boots, refusing to be lured to battle till winter drives the English off. It is usual in all accounts of the great struggle to find that certain facts have been suppressed. Let us frankly confess that when the English rangers were foraging, they brought back French scalps, and when the French Indians went scouting, they returned with English scalps. However, manners were improving. Strict orders are given. This is not a war on women. Neither women nor children are to be touched. Wolfe posts proclamations on the parish churches, calling all the habitants to stand neutral. In answer, they tear the proclamations down. By July 12th, Wolfe's batteries on the south side of the river are preparing to shell the city. A band of 500 students and habitants rose across from Quebec by night to dislodge the English gunners by mistaking their own shots for shots of the enemy, fall on each other in the dark, and retreat in wild confusion. Then the English cannon begin to do business. In a single day half the houses of Lower Town are battered to bits, and high tossed bombs have plunged through roofs of Upper Town, burning the cathedral and setting a multitude of lesser buildings on fire. In the confusion of cannonade and counter-cannonade and a city on fire, shrouding the ruins in a pall of smoke, some English ships slip up the river beyond Quebec, but there the precipice of the river bank is still steeper, and Bougainville is on guard with two thousand men. For thirty miles around the English rangers have laid the country waste. Still Montcalm refuses to come out and fight. The enforced inaction exasperates Wolfe, whose health is failing him and who sees the season passing, no nearer the object of his ambition than when he came. As he had stormed the batteries of Louisbourg, so now he decides to storm the heights of Montmercy. To anyone who has stood on the knob of rock above the gorge where the cataract plunges to the St. Lawrence, or has scrambled down the bank, slippery with spray, and watch the black underpool whirl out to the river, Wolfe's venture must seem madness, for French troops line the entrenchments above the cliff, and below a redoubt our battery had been built. Below the cataract, when the tide ebbed, was a place which might be forded from sunrise to sunset all the last days of July. Wolfe's cannon boomed from levees across the city, from the fleet in mid-channel, from the land camp on the east side of Montmercy. Montcalm rightly guessed this presaged a night assault. To hide his design, Wolfe kept his transport shifting up and down the St. Lawrence, as if to land at Beauport halfway to the city. All the same, two armed transports, as if by chance, managed to get themselves stranded just opposite the redoubt below the cliff, where their cannon would protect a landing. Montcalm saw the move and strengthened the troops behind the earthworks on the top of the cliff. Toward sunset the tide ebbed, and at that time cannon were firing from all points with such fury that the St. Lawrence lay hidden in smoke. As the air cleared, two thousand men were seen wading and fording below the falls. There was a rush of the tall grenadiers for the redoubt. The French retreated firing, and the cliff above poured down an avalanche of shots. At that moment Wolfe suffered a cruel and unforeseen check. 
a frightful thunderstorm burst on the river lashing earth and air to darkness it was impossible to see five paces ahead or to aim a shot the cliff roared down with miniature rivulets and the slippery clay bank gave to every step of the climbers slithering down waist deep in mud and weeds powder was soaked as the rain ceased indians were seen sliding down the cliff to sculp the wounded wolf ordered a retreat the drums rolled the recall and, and the english escaped pell-mell the french hooting with derision at the top of the banks the english yelling back strong oaths for the enemy to come out of its rat hole and fight like men at the ford the men soaked like water rats and a sorry rabble got into some sort of rank and burned the two stranded vessels as they passed back to the east side in less than an hour four hundred and forty three men had fallen the most of them killed many both dead and wounded into the hands of the indian scalpers one can guess wolf's fearful despair that night a month had passed he had accomplished worse than nothing in another month the fleet must leave the st lawrence to avoid autumn storms fragile at all times wolf fell ill ill of fever and of chagrin and those officers over whose head he had been promoted did not spare their criticisms their malice it is so easy to win battles of life and war in theory as for quebec it was felt the siege was over the contest won still bad news had come from the west niagara had fallen before the english and the forts on lake champlain were abandoned to amherst nothing now barred the english advance down the richelieu to montreal montcalm dispatches levies to montreal with eight hundred men end of section twenty eight recording by linda ray nielsen vancouver b c Section number 29 of Canada, The Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, The Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1756 to 1763 part 4 why did amherst not come to wolfe's aid his enemies say because the commanding general was so sure the siege of quebec would fail that he did not want any share of the blame that may be unjust amherst was of the slow cautious kind who marched doggedly to victory he may not have wished to risk a second titicondra wolfe's position was now desperate his only alternatives were success or ruin you can't cure me he told his surgeon but mend me up so i can go on for a few days what he did in those few days left his name immortal robert stobo who had been captured from Washington's battalions on the Ohio, and who knew every foot of Quebec from five years of captivity, had escaped, joined Wolfe, and drawn plans of all surroundings. From his ship above Quebec, Wolfe could see there was one path just behind the city where men might ascend to the plains of Abraham outside the rear wall, but the path was guarded and bougainville's troops patrolled westward as far as cape rouge it was now september from their trenches above the river the french could see the english evacuating camp at montmorency they were jubilant surely the english were giving up the siege night after night english transports loaded with soldiers ascended the st lawrence above quebec what did it mean was it a feign to draw montcalm's men away from the east side 
the French general was sleeplessly anxious. He had not passed a night in bed since the end of June. The fall rains were beginning, and another month of work in the trenches meant half the army invalided. The most of the English fleet was working up and down with the tide between the western limits of Quebec and Cape Rouge, nine miles away. Bougainville's force was increased to 3,000 men, and he was ordered to keep a special watch westward. The sleepiness of the precipice was guard enough near the town. Wednesday, the 12th of September, the English troops were ordered to hold themselves in readiness. They passed the day cleaning their arms, and were ordered not to speak after nightfall or permit a sound to be heard from the ranks. Admiral Saunders, with the main fleet, was to feign attack on the east side of the city. Admiral Holmes, with Wolfe's army, now numbering not 4,000 men, was to glide down with the tide from Cape Rouge above Quebec. Because the main fleet lay on the east side, Montcalm felt sure the attack would come from that quarter. Deserters had brought word to Wolfe that some flatboats with provisions were coming down the river to Quebec that night. Here, then, the position. Saunders on the east side, opposite Beauport, feigning attack. Montcalm watching him from the Beauport cliffs. Wolfe nine miles up the river west of the city. Bougainville watching him, watching too for those provisions, for Quebec was down to empty lauder. It was said that as Wolfe rested his ship, the Sutherland, off Cape Rouge, he felt strange premonition of approaching death, and repeated the words of Gray's elegy, The paths of glory lead but to the grave. But this has been denied. Certainly he had such strange consciousness of impending death that, taking a miniature of his fiancée from his breast, he asked a fellow officer to return it to her. About midnight the tide began to ebb, and two lanterns were hung as a sign from the masthead of the Sutherland. Instantly all the ships glided silent as the great river down with the tide. The night was moonless. Near the little bridle path now known as Wolf's Cove, the ships draw ashore. Sharp as iron on stone, a sentry's voice rings out, Who goes? The French, answers an officer who speaks perfect French. What regiment? The Queen's, replies the officer who chances to know that Bougainville has a regiment of that name. Thinking they were provision transports, this sentry was satisfied. Not so another. He ran down to the water's edge, and peering through the darkness, called, Why can't you speak louder? Hush you, we'll be overheard, answers the English officer in French. Thus the English boats glided towards the little bridle path that led up to the rear of the city. Wolf's Cove is not a path steep as a stair in the face of a rock, as most of the school books teach. It is a little weed-grown, stony gully, easy to climb, but slant and narrow, where I have walked many a night to drink from the spring near the foot of the cliff. Twenty-four volunteers led the way up the stony path, silent and agile as cats. At the top are the tents of the sentries, who rush from their couches to be overpowered by the English. Before daybreak the whole army has ascended to the plateau behind the city, known as the Plains of Abraham. No use entering here into the dispute whether Wolfe took his place where the goal now stands, or farther back from the city wall. Roughly speaking, the main line of Wolfe's forces, three deep, with himself, Monckton, and Murray, in command, face the rear of Quebec about three-quarters of a mile from what was then the wall. To his left was the wooded road now known as St. Louis. He posts Townsend facing this, at right angles to his front line. Another battalion lay in the woods to the rear. 
there were besides a reserve regiment and a battalion to guard the landing what was wolfe's position behind him lay bougainville with three thousand french soldiers fresh and in perfect condition in front lay quebec with three thousand more to his right was the river to his left across the st charles montcalm's main army of five thousand men when your enemies blunder don't interrupt them napoleon is reported to have advised if some one had not blundered badly now it might have been a second ticagaronda with wolf but some one did blunder most tragically montcalm had come from the trenches above beauport where he had been guarding against saunders landing and he had ordered hot tea and beer served to the troops when he happened to look across the st charles river toward quebec it had been cloudy but the sun had just burst out and there standing in the morning light were the english in battle array red coat and tartan kilt grenadier and highlander in the distance a confused mass of color which was not the white uniform of the french this is a serious business said montcalm hurriedly to his aide then spurs to his black horse he was galloping furiously along the beauport road over the resounding bridge across the st charles up the steep cobblestone streets that led from lower to upper town and out by the st louis road to the plains of abraham in quebec all was confusion who had given the order for the troops to move out against the english without waiting for bougainville to come from cape rouge but there they were huddling disordered columns that crowded on each other filing out of the st louis and st john gates with a long string of battalions following montcalm up from the st charles and ramsay who was commandant of the city refused to send out part of his troops and vaudreuil who was at beauport delayed to come and though montcalm waited till ten o'clock bougainville did not come up from cape rouge with his three thousand men easy to criticize and say montcalm should have waited till bougainville and vaudreuil came he could not wait for wolfe's position cut his forces in two and the army was without supplies with his four thousand five hundred men he accepted fate's challenge bagpipes shrilling english flags waving to the wind the french soldiers shouting riotously the two armies moved towards each other then the english halted silent motionless statues the men were refreshed for during the four hours wait from daylight wolfe had permitted them to rest on the grassed plain the french came bounding forward firing as they ran and bending down to reload the english waited till the french were but forty yards away they were not to throw away their fire wolfe had ordered now forty yards if you measure it off in your mind's eye is short space between hostile armies it is not as wide as the average garden front in a suburban city then suddenly the thin red line of the english spoke in a crash of fire the shots were so simultaneous that they sounded like one terrific crash of ear-splitting thunder the french had no time to halt before a second volley rent the air then a clattering fire rocketed from the british like echoes from a precipice with wild halloo the british were charging 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 the highlanders leading with their broadswords flashing overhead and their mountain blood on fire wolf to the fore of the grenadiers till a shot broke his wrist wrapping his handkerchief about the wound he as he ran the victorious young general was dashing forward when a second shot hit him and a third pierced his breast he staggered a step reeled fell to the ground three soldiers and an officer ran to his aid and carried him in their arms to the rear he would have no surgeon it was useless he said but the day is ours i see that you keep it 
he muttered, sinking back into unconsciousness. A moment later he was roused by wild, hilarious, jubilant, heart-shattering shouts. Gad! They run! See how they run! said an English voice. Who run? demanded Wolfe, roused as if from the sleep of death. The enemy, sir, they give way everywhere. Go one of you, commanded the dying general. Tell Colonel Burton to march Webb's regiment down Charles River to cut off retreat by the bridge. Now God be praised, he added, sinking back. I die in peace. And the spirit of Wolfe had departed, leaving as a heritage, a new empire of the north, and an immortal fame. Fate had gone hard against the gallant Montcalm. The first volley from the English line had mowed his soldiers down like ripe wheat. At the second volley the ranks broke, and the ground was thick strewn with the dead. When the English charged, the French fled in wildest panic downhill for the St. Charles. Wounded and faint, Montcalm, on his black charger, was swept swiftly along St. Louis Road in the blind stampede of retreat. Near the walls, a ball passed through his groins. Two soldiers caught him from falling and steadied him on either side of his horse through St. Louis Gate, where women, waiting in mad anxiety, saw the blood dripping over his horse. My God, my God, our Marquis is slain, they screamed. It is nothing, nothing, good friends. Don't trouble about me, answered the wounded general as he passed for the last time under the arc gateway of St. Louis Road. How long do I have to live? he asked the surgeon into whose house he had been carried. Few hours, my lord. So much the better, answered Montcalm. I shall not live to see Quebec surrendered. Before daylight he was dead. Wrapped in his soldier's cloak, laid in a rough box, the body was carried that night to the Ursuline convent, where a bursting bomb had scooped a great hole in the floor. Sad-eyed nuns and priests crowded the chapel. By torchlight, amid tears and sobs, the body was laid to rest. Both generals had died as they had lived gallantly. Today they are both regarded as heroes and commemorated by monuments. But how did their governments treat them? Of course there were wild huzzas in London and solemn memorial services over Wolf. But when his aged mother petitioned the government that her dead son's salary might be computed at ten pounds a day, the salary of a commander-in-chief, instead of two pounds a day, she was refused in as curtly uncivil a note as was ever penned. Montcalm had died in debt, and when his family petitioned the French government to pay these debts, the king thought it should be done, but he did not take the trouble to see that his good intention was carried out. It was easy and cheaper for orators to talk of heroes giving their lives for their country there are no better examples in history of the truth that glory and honor and true service must be their own reward, independent of any compensation, any suffering, any sacrifice. Though the panic retreat continued for hours and Quebec was not surrendered for some days, the battle was practically decided in ten minutes. The campaign of next year was gallant but fruitless. In April, before the fleet has come back to the English, de la Vie throws himself with the remnants of the French army against the rear wall of Quebec, and as Montcalm had come out to fight Wolfe, so Murray marches out to fight de la Vie. Both sides claim the Battle of St. Foy as victory, but another such victory would have exterminated the English. Levies outside the walls, Murray glad to be inside the walls. Each side waited for the spring fleet. If France had come to Canada's aid, even yet the country might have been won, for sickness had reduced Murray's army to less than three thousand able men. But the flag that flaunted from the ship that sailed into the harbor of Quebec 
on the ninth of May was British. That decided Canada's fate. De Levy retreated swiftly from Montreal, but by September the slow-moving General Amherst has closed in on Montreal from the west, and up the St. Lawrence from the east proceeds General Murray. De Levy and Vaudreuil had less than 2,000 fighting men at Montreal. September 8th they capitulated, and three years later, by the Treaty of Paris, Canada passed under the dominion of England. Officers, many of the nobility, Bigot and his crew, sailed for France, where the intendant's ring were put on trial and punished for their corruption and misrule. Bigot suffered banishment and the confiscation of property. The other members of his clique received like sentences. Spite of the hopes of her devoted founders, like Champlain and Maisonneuve, spite of the blood of her martyrs and the prayers of her missionaries, spite of all the pathfinding of her explorers, spite of the dauntless warfare of her soldier knights, like Frontenac, Iberville, and Montcalm, New France had fallen. Why? For two reasons. Because of England's sea power, because of the unblushing, shameless, gilded corruption of the French court, which cared less for the fate of Canada than the leer of a painted fool behind her fan. But be this remembered, and here was the hand of overruling destiny or providence. The fall of New France, like the fall of the seed to the ready soil, was the rebirth of a new nation. Henceforth it is not New France, the appendage of an old world nation. It is Canada, a new dominion. Today wander round Quebec. Tablets and monuments consecrate many of the old hero days. Though the British government rebuilt a line of walls in the early 1800s, you will find it hard to trace even a vestige of the old French walls. Mounds will tell you where there were bastions. A magnificent boulevard tops the most of the old ramparts. An imposing hotel stands where Castle St. Louis once frowned over the St. Lawrence. Of the palace where the intendant held his revels, there are not even ruins. If you drive out past Beaupart, you will find at the end of the nine-mile forest path the crumbling brick walls of Chateau Bigot, the Hermitage, half buried in the days when I visited it, with rose vines and orchard trees gone wild. That is all you will find of the court clique whose folly brought Canada's doom. But as you drive back from Beaupart, there towers the city from the rocky heights above the St. Lawrence. Chapel spire and cross and domed cathedral roofs a glint in the sunlight like a city of gold. The church, baptized by the blood of its martyrs, is there in pristine power, and the fruitful meadows bear witness to the prosperity of the habitant on whom the burden fell in the days of the ancient regime. Who shall say that habitant and church do not deserve the peace of power they hold in the government of the dominion? End of section 29. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 30 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North, by Agnes C. Lott. From 1763 to 1812, Part 1. Quebec had fallen. As jackals gather to feast on the carcasses of the dead lion, so rallies a rabble of adventurers on the trail of the victorious army. Settlers, traders, teamsters, riffraff, 
soldiers of fortune, stampede to Montreal and Quebec as to a new gold field. When Major Robert Rogers, the English forest ranger, proceeds up the lakes to take over the western fur posts, Presque Isle, Detroit, Michilmackinac, he is followed by hosts of adventurers looking for swift way to fortune by either the fur trade or by picking the bones of the dead lion. Major Rogers, beating up Lake Ontario and Lake Erie with two hundred bushwhackers, pausing in camp near modern Sandusky, meets the renowned Ottawa warrior Pontenac, who had fought with the French against Braddock, and now wants to know in voice of thunder what all this talk about the French being conquered means. How dare the French, because they have proved paltrons, deed away the Indian lands of Canada? How dare Rogers, the white chief of the English rangers, come here with his pale-faced warriors to Pontenac's land? How Rogers answered the veteran red-skinned warrior is not told. All that is known is the French gave up their western furs with bad grace, and the English commandants forgot to appease the wound to the Indians' pride by the customary gifts over solemn powwow. At Detroit and Michilmackinac, the French quietly withdrew from the palisades and built their whitewashed cottages outside the limits of the fort. Twenty-five hundred French habitants there are at Detroit. If the four or five hundred English adventurers who swarmed to Canada on the heels of the English army thought to batten on the sixty thousand defeated French inhabitants, far otherwise thought and decreed the English generals, Sir Geoffrey Amherst and Murray, who succeeded him. You will observe that the French are British subjects as much as we are and treat them accordingly ruled amherst and general murray who practically became the first governor of canada on hammer's withdrawal at once set in himself to establish justice no more forced labor no more carrion birds of the official classes like bigot fattening on the poor habitants British government in Canada for the next few years is known as the period of military rule. At Quebec, at Three Rivers, at Montreal, the commanding officers established martial law with bi-weekly courts, and in the parishes the local French officers or seigneurs are authorized to hear civil cases. By the terms of surrender, the people have been guaranteed their religious liberty and the Treaty of Paris, which cedes all Canada to England in 1763, repeats this guarantee, though it leaves a thorn of trouble in the flesh of England by reserving to France, for the benefit of the Grand Banks fishermen, the islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon, as well as shore rights of fishing on the west coast of Newfoundland also the proprietary rights of jesuits sulpinians franciscans are to remain in abeyance for the pleasure of the english crown the rights of the sisterhoods are at once confirmed one of general murray's first acts as governor is to convey gentle hint to the abbey le lotre now released from prison and come back to canada that his absence will be appreciated by the government. Within a few years there are five hundred English residents in Montreal and Quebec, and now trouble begins for the government. That wrangle between English and French, between Protestant and Catholic, which is to go on for a hundred years and retard Canada's progress by a century. Being British-born subjects, the few hundred demand that the governor call an assembly, an elective assembly, but by the laws of England, Roman Catholics must abjure their religion before they can take office, and by the Treaty of Paris, the Catholics of Canada have been guaranteed the freedom of their religion. To grant an elective assembly now 
would mean that the representatives of the five hundred English traders would rule over seventy thousand French. When accusing the French Catholics of Quebec of remaining a solitary, so that they may wield the balance of power, it is well to remember how and when the quarrel began. Murray sides with the French and stands like a rock for their right. He will have no elective assembly under present conditions, and he puts summary stop to the business English magistrates and English bailiffs have hatched against the rights of the habitant, of seizing lands for debt at a time when money is scarce, summoning the debtor simultaneously to two different courts, then charging such outrageous fees that the debtor's land is sold for the fees, to be brought in by the rascal ring who have arranged the plot. Ordinances are still proclaimed in primitive fashion by the crier going through the streets, shouting the laws to beat of drum. But as the crier shouts in English, the habitants know no more of the laws than if he shouted in Greek. As Murray opposes the clamor of the English minority, the English petition the home government for Murray's recall. In the light of the fact there were no schools at all in Canada except the Catholic seminaries, and that of the five hundred English residents, only two hundred had permanent homes in Montreal and Quebec, it is rather instructive to read, as one of the grievances of the English minority, that the only teachers in Canada were Catholics. The Governor Generalship is offered to Chatham, the great statesman, at five thousand pounds a year. Chatham refusing the position, there comes in 1768 as Governor, at twelve hundred pounds a year, Sir Guy Carleton, fellow soldier and friend of Wolfe in the Great War, who follows in Murray's footsteps, stands like a rock for the rights of the French, orders debtors released from jail, fees reduced, and a stoppage of force land sales. Bitter is the disappointment to the land jobbers, who had looked for a partisan in Carleton. Doubly bitter, for Carleton goes one better than Murray. For years the French government had issued paper money in Quebec. At the conquest, seventeen million of these worthless government promissory notes were outstanding in the hands of the habitants. Knowing that the paper money is to be redeemed by the English government, English jobbers are now busy buying up the paper among the poor French at fifteen cents on the dollar. Carleton sends the town crier from parish to parish, warning the habitants to hold their money and register the amounts with the magistrates till the whole matter can be arranged between England and France. The first newspaper is established now in Quebec, the Quebec Gazette, printed in both English and French. Also the first trouble now arises from having ceded France, the two tiny islands south of Newfoundland, St. Pierre and Miquelon. By English navigation laws, all trade must be in English ships. Good. The smugglers slip into St. Pierre with a cargo. By night a ship with a white sail slips out of St. Pierre with that cargo. At Gaspé the sail of that ship is red. At Saguenay it is yellow. At Quebec it is perhaps brown. Ostensibly the ship is a fishing smack, but it leaves other cargo than fish at the habitant hamlets of the St. Lawrence. And the smuggling from St. Pierre that began in Carleton's time is continued today in the very same way. And Guy Carleton, though he is an Englishman and owes his appointment to the complaints of the English minority against Murray, remains absolutely impartial. Good reason for the wisdom of his policy. There are rumblings from the New England colonies that forewarn the coming earthquake. For years friction has been growing between the mother country and the colonies. The story of the revolution does not belong to the story of Canada. For years far-sighted statesmen had predicted 
that the minute New England ceased to fear New France, ceased to need England's protection, that minute the growing friction would flame in open war. Carleton foresaw that to pander to the English minority would sacrifice the loyalty of the French. Thus he reported to the home government and the Quebec Act of 1774 came to relief of the French. By it, Canada's boundaries were extended across the region of the Ohio to the Mississippi. French laws were restored in all civil actions. English law was to rule in criminal cases, which meant trial by jury. The French are relieved from oaths of offices and enabled to serve on the jury. Also, the Catholic clergy is entitled to collect its usual tithe of one twenty-six from the Catholics. An elective assembly is refused for reasons that are plain, but a legislative council is granted to be appointed by the Crown. For the expense of the government, a slight tax is levied on liquor, but as the St. Pierre smuggling is now flourishing, the tax does not begin to meet the cost of government and the difference is paid from the imperial treasury. However badly the imperial government blundered with the New England colonies, her treatment of Quebec was an object lesson in colonizing to the world. Had she treated her New England colonies half as justly as she treated Quebec, British America might today extend to Mexico. Had she treated Quebec half as unjustly as she treated her own offspring of New England, the United States might today extend to the Arctic Circle. The man who saved Canada to England, in the first place by wisdom, in the second place by war, was Sir Guy Carleton. While the English and French, Protestant and Catholic, wrangle for power in Quebec, there rages on the frontier one of the most devastating Indian wars known to American history. Not for nothing had Pontenet drawn himself to his full height and defied Major Rogers down on Lake Erie. From tribe to tribe the light couriers ran, naked but for the breechcloth, painted as for war, carrying in one hand the tomahawk dipped in blood, in the other the wampum belt of purple, typifying war. The French had deeded away the Indian lands to the English. The news ran like wildfire, ran by moccasin telegram from Montreal up Ottawa River to Michamekinac, from Niagara westward to Detroit and southward to Presque Isle, and all that chain of forts leading southwestward to the Mississippi. Was it a conspiracy of Pontenac, as it had been called? Hardly. It was more one of those general movements of unrest or discontent, of misunderstanding, that but awaits the appearance of a brave leader to become a torrent of destruction. Pontenac, the Ottawa chief, was such a leader, and his standard rallied Indians from Virginia from the Mississippi, from Lake Superior. Of the universal unrest among the Indians, the English were not ignorant, but they failed to realize its significance, failed, too, to realize that the French fur traders, cast out of the western forts, and now roaming the wilds, fanned the flame, gave presents of gunpowder and firearms to the savages, and egged the hostiles on against the new possessors of Canada, in order to divert the fur trade to French traders still in Louisiana. Down at Miami, southwest of Lake Erie, Ensign Holmes hears in March of 1763 that the war belt has been carried to the Illinois. Up at Detroit, in May, Pontenac is camped on the east side of the river with eight hundred hunters. Daily the French farmers, who supply the fort with provisions, carry word to Major Gladwin that the Indians are acting strangely, holding long and secret powwow, 
borrowing files to saw off the barrels of their muskets short. A Frenchwoman, who has visited the Indians across the river for a supply of maple sugar, comes to Gladwin on May 5th with the same story. From 800, the Indians increased to 2,000. Old Catherine, a toothless squaw, comes shaking as with the palsy to the fort, and with mumbling words warns Gladwin to beware, beware. So does a young girl whose fine eyes have caught the fancy of Gladwin himself. Breaking out with bitter weeping, she covers her head with her shawl and bids her white lover have a care how he meets Pontiac in council. Gladwin himself was a seasoned campaigner who had escaped the hurricane of death with Braddock and had also served under Amherst at Montreal. In his fort are 120 soldiers and 40 traders. At the wharf lie two armed schooners, Beaver and Gladwin. When Pontiac comes with his 60 warriors, Gladwin is ready for him. In the council house the warriors seat themselves, weapons concealed under blankets. But when Pontiac raises the wampum belt that was to be the signal for the massacre to begin, Major Gladwin, never moving his light blue eyes from the snaky gleam of the Indian, waves his hand, and at the motion there is a roll of drums, a grounding of the sentry's arms, trampling of soldiers outside, a rush as the white men marching. Pontiac is dumbfounded and departs without giving the signal. Back in his cabin of rushes across the river, he rages like a maniac and buries a tomahawk in the skull of the old squaw Catherine. Monday, May ninth, at ten o'clock, he comes again, followed by a rabble of hunters. The gates are shut in his face. He shouts for an admittance. The sentry opens the wicket and in traitor's vernacular bids him go about his business. There is a wild war yell. The siege of Detroit begins. The story of that siege would fill volumes. For fifteen months it lasted, the French remaining neutral, selling provisions to both sides. Gladwin defiant inside his palisades, the Indians persistent as enraged hornets. The two English officers who have been out hunting are waylaid, murdered, skinned, the skin sewed into powder pouches, the bloody carcasses sent drifting down on the flood of the waters past the fort walls. Desperately in need of provisions from the French, Gladwin consents to temporary truce while Captain Campbell and others go out to parley with the Indians. Gladwin obtains cartloads of provisions during the parley, but Pontiac violates the honor of war by holding the messengers captive. Burning arrows are shot at the fort walls. Gladwin's men sally out by night, hack down the orchards that conceal the enemy, burn all outbuildings, and come back without losing a man. Nightly, too, lapping the canoe noiselessly across water with the palm of the hand, one of the French farmers comes with fresh provisions. Gladwin has sent a secret messenger with letter in his powder pouch through the lines of the besiegers to Niagara for aid. May 30th, moving slowly, all sails out, the English flag flying from the prow, comes a convey of sailboats up the river. Cheer on cheer rent the air. The soldiers at watch in the galleries inside the palisades tossed their caps overhead, but as the ships come nearer, the whites were paralyzed with horror. Silence froze the cheer on the parted lips. Indian warriors manned the boats. The convey of ninety-six men had been cut to pieces, only a few soldiers escaping back to Niagara, a few coming on, compelled by the Indians to act as rowers. As the boats passed the fort, whoops of derision, wild war chants, eldritch screams, rose from the Indians. 
one desperate white captive rose like a flash from his place at the rowlocks caught his indian captor by the scruff of the neck and threw him into the river but the redskin grappled the other in a grip of death turning over and over locked in each other's arms the hate of the inferno in their faces soldier and indian swept down to watery death in the river tide taking advantage of the confusion and under protection of the fort guns one of the other captives sprang into the river and succeeded in swimming safely to the fort terrible was the news he brought all the other forts south of niagara with the exception of fort pitt miami st joseph presque isle lay in ashes from some not a man had escaped to tell the story that night it was a pitch dark soft velvet warm summer darkness from the fort the soldiers could see the sixty captives from the convoy burning outside at the torture stakes then as gray morning came mangled corpses floated past on the river tide june eighteenth another vessel glides up the river with help but the garrison is afraid of a second disaster for eight hundred warriors have lain in ambush along the river gladwin orders a cannon fired the boat fires back answer but the wind falls and she is compelled to anchor for the night below the fort sixty soldiers armed to the teeth are on board but the captain is determined to outtrick the indians and he permits only twelve of his men at a time on deck darkness has barely fallen on the river before the waters are alive with canoes and naked warriors clamber to the decks like scrambling monkeys so that they have outnumbered their prey that they forgot all caution at the signal of a hammer knock on deck rap 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 three times short and sharp up swarm the soldiers from the hatchway fourteen indians dropped on deck in as many seconds others were thrown on bayonet points into the river it is said that after the fight of a few seconds on the ship the decks looked like a butcher's shambles finally the schooner anchored at detroit to the immense relief of the beleaguered garrison so elated were the english one soldier dashed from a sally port and scalped a dying indian in full view of both sides swift came indian vengeance captain campbell the truce messenger was hacked into pieces by july twenty eighth Dazelle had come from Niagara with nearly two hundred men, including Rogers, the famous Indian fighter. Both Dazelle and Rogers are mad for a rush from the fort to deal with one crushing blow to the Indians. Here the one mistake of the siege was made. Gladwin was against all risk, for the Indians were now dropping off to the hunting field but Dazelle and Rogers were for punishing them before they left. In the midst of a dense night fog, the English sallied from the fort at two o'clock on the 31st of July for Pontenac's main camp, about two miles up the river. Boats rowing upstream abreast the marchers. It was hot and sultry. The 250 bushrangers marched in shirt sleeves two abreast a narrow footbridge led across a brook since known as bloody run to cliffs behind which the indians were entrenched along the trail were the whitewashed cottages of the french farmers who stared from their windows in their nightcaps amazed beyond speech at the rashness of the english on a smaller scale it was the repetition of braddock's defeat on the ohio indians lay in ambush behind every house every shrub in the long grass they only waited till dazelle's men had crossed the bridge and were charging the hill at a run then the war whoop shrilled both to fore and to rear the indians doubled up on their trapped foe from both sides 
Roger's rangers dash for hiding in a house. The drum beat retreat. Under cover of Roger's shots from one side, shots from the boats on the other, Dazelle's men escaped at a panic run back over the trail with a loss of some sixty dead. In September came more ships with more men, again to be ambushed at the Narrows, and again to reach Detroit, as the old record says, bloody as a butcher's shop. So the siege dragged on for more than a year at Detroit. Winter witnessed a slight truce to fighting, for starvation drove the Indians to the hunting field. But May saw Pontiac again encamped under the walls of Detroit, till word came from the French on the lower Mississippi in October, definitely and for all, they would not join the Indians. Then Pontiac knew his cause was lost. End of section 30. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 31 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North, by Agnes C. Lott. From 1763 to 1812, Part 2. Up the Michilmackinac, similar scenes were enacted. Major Earthington and Captain Leslie had some thirty-five soldiers. There were also hosts of traders outside the walls, among whom was Alexander Henry of Montreal. Word had come of Pontiac at Detroit, but Etherington did not realize that the uprising was general. June 4th was the king's birthday. Shops had been closed. Flags blew above the fort. Gates were wide open. Squaws with heads under shawls sat hunched around the house steps, with that concealed beneath their shawls which the English did not guess. All the men except Henry, who was writing letters, and some Frenchmen, who understood the danger signs, had gone outside the gates to watch a fast and furious game of lacrosse. Again and again the ball came bounding towards the fort gates only to be whisked to the other end of the field by a deft toss, followed by the swift runners. No one was louder in applause than Ethington. The officers were completely off guard. Suddenly the crowd swayed, gave way, opened, and down the fields towards the fort gates surged the players. A dexterous pitch. The ball was inside the fort. After it dashed the Indians. In a flash, weapons were grasped from the shawls of the squaws. Musket and knife did the rest. When Henry heard the war whoop and looked from a window, he saw Indian warriors bending to drink the blood of the hearts that were yet warm. For two days Henry lived in the rubbish heap of the attic in the house of Langlade, a pioneer of Wisconsin. Of the whites at Michilmackinac, only twenty escaped death, and they were carried prisoners to the lower country for ransom. From Virginia to Lake Superior, such was the Indian War known as Pontiac's Campaign. Fort Pitt held out like Detroit. Niagara was too strong for assault, but in September twenty-four soldiers, who had been protecting Portage past the falls, were waylaid and driven over the precipice at the place called Devil's Hole. More soldiers sent to the rescue met like fate, horses and wagons being stampeded over the rocks, seventy men in all being hurled to death in the wild canyon. Amherst, who was a military commander at the time, was driven nearly out of his senses. A foe like the French, who would stand and do battle, he could fight. But this phantom foe, that vanished like mist through the woods, baffled the English soldier. 
In less than six months, two thousand whites had been slain, and Amherst could not even find his foe, let alone strike him. Can we not inoculate them with smallpox, or set bloodhounds to track them? He writes distractedly. By the summer of 1764, the English had taken the war path. Bradstreet was to go up the lakes with 1,200 men. Bouquet, with like forces, to follow the old Pennsylvania road to the Ohio. Both generals to unite somewhere south of Lake Erie. Of Bradstreet, the least said the better. He had done well in the Great War when he captured Fort Frontenac almost without a blow. But now he strangely played the fool. He seemed to think that peace, peace at any price, was the object, whereas peace, that is not a victory, is worthless with the Indian. Deputies met him on the 12th of August, near Presque Isle, Lake Erie. They carried no wampum belts and were really spies. Without demanding reparation, without a word as to restoring harried captives, without hostages for good conduct, Bradstreet entered into a fool's peace with his foes, proceeded up to Detroit, and was back at Niagara by winter, though he must have realized the worthlessness of the campaign when his messengers sent to the Illinois were ambushed. When Bouquet heard of the sham peace, he was furious and repudiated Bradstreet's treaty in toto. Bouquet was a veteran of the Great War, and he knew bush fighting from seven years' experience on Pennsylvania frontiers. Slowly, with his 1,500 rangers and 500 highlanders, express riders keeping the trail open from fort to fort, scouts to four, Bouquet moved along the old army trail used by Forbes to reach Fort Pitt. Friendly Indians had been warned to keep green branches as signals in the muzzles of their guns. All others were to be shot without mercy. Indians vanished before his march, like mist before the sun. August 5th found Bouquet south of Fort Pitt at a place known as Bushy Run. The scouts had gone ahead to prepare nooning for the army at the run. In seven hours the men had marched seventeen miles in spite of sweltering heat. But at one, just as the thirsty columns were nearing the rest place, the crack, crack, crack of rifle shots to the fore set every man's blood jumping. From quick march they broke to a run, priming guns, ball in mouth as they ran. A moment later the old trick of Braddock's ambush was being repeated, but this time the Indians were dealing with a seasoned man. Bouquet swung his fighters in a circle round the stampeding horses and provision wagons. The heat was terrific, the men almost mad with thirst, the horses neighing and plunging and breaking away to the woods, and the army stood, a red-coated tartan-plaid target for invisible foes. But this time the men were fighting as Indians fight, breaking ranks, jumping from tree to tree. It isn't easy to keep men standing as targets when they can't get at the foe. But Bouquet, riding from place to place, kept his men in hand till darkness screened them. Sixty had fallen. A circular barricade was built of flower bags. Inside this the wounded were laid and the army camped without water. The agonies of that night need not be told. Here the neighing of horses would bring down a clatter of bullets aimed in the dark, and the groans of the wounded, trampled by the stampeding cavalcade, would mingle with the screams of terror from the horses. The night continued hot almost as day in the sultry forest, and the thirst with both man and beast became anguish. Another such day and another such night, and Bouquet could foresee his fate would be worse than Braddock's. Passing from man to man, he gave the army their instructions for the next day. They would form into three platoons, with the center battalion advanced to the fore as if to lead attack. 
Suddenly the center was to feign defeat and turn as if in panic flight. It was to be guessed that the Indians would pursue headlong. Instantly the flank battalions were to sweep through the woods in wide circle and close in on the rear of the savages. Then the fleeing center was to turn. The savages would be surrounded. Daybreak came with a crackling of shots from ambush. Officers and men carried out instructions exactly as Bouquet had planned. At ten o'clock the center column broke ranks, wavered, turned, fled in wild panic. With the whooping of a wolf pack in full cry, the savages burst from ambush in pursuit. The sides deployed. A moment later the center had turned to fight the pursuer, and the highlanders broke from the woods, yelling their slogan, with broad swords cutting a terrible hand-to-hand -hand swath. Sixty Indians were slashed to death in as many seconds. Though the British lost one hundred and fifteen, killed and wounded, the Indians were in full flight, blind terror at their heels. The way was now open to Port Pitt, but Bouquet did not dally inside the palisades. On down the Ohio he pursued the panic-stricken savages, pausing neither for deputies nor reinforcements. At Muskingum Creek the Indians sent back the old men to sue, sue objectively for peace at any cost. Bouquet met them with the stern front that never fails to win respect. They need not palm off their lie that the fault lay with the foolish young warriors. If the old chiefs would not control the young braves, then the whole tribe, the whole Indian race, must pay the penalty. In terror the deputies hung their heads. He would not even discuss the terms of peace. Bouquet declared, till the Indians restored every captive, man, woman, and child, even the child of Indian parentage born in captivity. The captives must be given suitable clothing, horses, and presents. Twelve days only would he permit them to gather the captives. If man, woman, or child were lacking on the twelfth day, he would pursue them and punish them to the utmost ends of earth. The Indians were dumbfounded. These were not soft words. Nor thus had the French spoken with the giving of manifold presents. But powder was exhausted. No more was coming from the French traders of the Mississippi. Winter was approaching, and the Indians must hunt or starve. Again the couriers are sent spurring the woods from tribe to tribe with wampum belts. But this time the belts are the white bands of peace. While Bouquet waits, he sends back over the trail for hospital nurses to receive the captives, and the army is sent knocking up rude barricades of log and thatch in the wilderness. Then the captives begin to come. It is a scene for the brush of artist, for the all-frontier men who have lost friends have rallied to Bouquet's camp, hoping against hope and afraid to hope. There is the mother whose infant child has been snatched from her arms in some frontier attack now scanning the lines as they come in mad with hope and fear there is the husband whose wife has been torn away to some savage's teepee searching 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 among the sad wild-eyed ill-clad rabble for one with some resemblance to the wife he loved there is the father seeking lost daughters and afraid of what he may find. And there are the captives themselves, some of the women demented from the abuse they have received. England may have spent her millions to protect her colonies, but she never spent in anguish what these rude frontiersmen suffered at Bouquet's camp. So ended what is known as the Pontiac War. Up at Detroit in 1765, Pontenac, in council with the whites, explained that he has listened to bad advice, but now his heart is right. Father, you have stopped the rum barrel while we talked, he says grimly. As our business is finished, we request that you open the barrel, 
and that we may drink and be merry. Not a very heroic curtain fall to a dramatic life, but pause a bit. The Pontiac War was the last united stand of a doomed race against the advance of the conquering alien, and the Indian is defeated, and he knows it, and he acknowledges it, and he drowns his despair in a vice, and so he passes down the long trail of time, with his face to the west, doomed, hopeless, push westward and ever west. Pontiac goes down the Mississippi to his friends, the fur traders of St. Louis. One morning in 1767, after a drinking bout, he is found across the river, lying in camp, with his skull split to the neck. By the sword he had lived, by the sword he perished. Was the murder the result of a drunken quarrel? Or did some frenzied frontiersman with deathless woes bribe the hand of the assassin? The truth of this matter is unknown, and Pontenac's death remains a theme for fiction. What with struggles for power and Indian wars, one might think that the few hundred English colonists of Quebec and Montreal had all they could do. Not so. Their quarrels with the French Catholics and fights with the Indians are merely incidental to the main aim of their lives, to the one object that has brought them stampeding to Canada as to a new gold field, namely, quick way to wealth. And the only quick way to wealth was by the fur trade. In the wilderness of the upcountry wander some two or three thousand cast-off wood rovers of the old French fur trade. As the prodigals come down to Ottawa, down the Detroit, down the St. Lawrence, the English and Scotch merchants of Montreal and Quebec meet them. Mighty names those merchants have in history now. McGillivrays and Mackenzies and McGills and Henrys and McClouds and McGregors and Ogilvies and McTavishes and Camerons. But at this period of the game, the most of them were what we today would call petty merchants or peddlers. In their storehouses, small, one-story frame affairs were packed goods for trade. With these goods, they quickly outfitted the French bush rover, $3,000 worth to a canoe, and packed the fellow back to the wilderness to trade on shares before any rival firm could hire him. Within five years of Wolfe's victory in 1759, all the French bush rovers of the upcountry had been re-engaged by merchants of Montreal and Quebec. Then imperceptible changes came, the changes that work so silently they are like destiny. Because it is unsafe to let the rascal bush rovers and voyageurs go off by themselves with three thousand dollars worth to the canoe load, the merchants began to accompany them westward. Bourgeois, the voyagers called their outfitters. Then, because success in fur trade must be kept secret, the merchants cease to have their men come down to Montreal. They meet them with the goods halfway at La Vendre's old stamping ground on Lake Superior, first at the place called Grand Portage, then, when the United States boundary is changed in 1783, at Kamit or modern Fort William, named after William McGillagravy. Pontiac's war puts a stop to the new trade, but by 1766 the merchants are west again. Henry goes up the Saskatchewan to the Forks, and comes back with such wealth of furs he retires a rich magnate of Montreal. The Frobisher brothers strike for a new hunting ground. So do Peter Pond and Bostonius, Pegman and the Mackenzies, Alexander and Roderick. Instead of following up the Saskatchewan, they strike from Lake Winnipeg northward for Churchill River and Athabasca, and they bring out furs that transform those peddlers into merchant princes. A little later, the chief buyer of the Montreal furs is one John Jacob Astor of New York. Then another change. 
rivalry hurts the fur trade especially do different prices demoralize the indians the montreal merchants pool their capital and become known as the northwest fur company they now hire their voyageurs outright on salary no man is paid less than what would be five hundred dollars in modern money with board and any man may rise to be clerk trader wintering partner with shares worth eight hundred pounds four thousand dollars that brings dividends of two and three hundred per cent the petty merchants whom murray and carleton despised become in twenty years the opulent aristocracy of montreal holding the most of the public offices dominating the government filling the judgeships and entertaining with a lavish hospitality that put vice-regal splendor in the shade the beaver club is the great rendezvous of the montreal partners fortitude in distress is the motto and lords of the ascendant is their practice no man neither governor nor judge may ignore these nor'westers and it may be added that they are a law into themselves one example will suffice a french merchant of montreal took into his head to have a share of this wealth-giving trade he was advised to pull his interests with the nor'westers and he foolishly ignored the advice in camp at grand portage on lake superior he is told all the country hereabout belongs to the nor'westers and he must decamp show me proofs this country is yours he answers show me the title deed and i shall decamp next night a band of nor'westers voyageurs well plied with rum came down the strand to the intruders tents they cut his tents to ribbons scattered his goods to the four winds and beat his voyageurs into insensibility voila there are our proofs they say the french merchant hastens down to montreal to bring lawsuit but the judges you must remember are shareholders in the northwest company and many of the legislative council are nor'westers what with real delays and sham delays and put-offs and legal fees justice is a bit tardy while the case is pending the french merchant tries again this time he is not molested at fort william they let him proceed on his way up the old trail to lake of the woods the trail found by la vendre and halfway through the wilderness where the cataract offers only one path for portage the frenchman finds nor'westers building a barricade he tears it down they build another he tears that down they build a third fast as he tears down they build up he must either go back baffled by the suave smiling lawless rivals or fight on the spot to the death but there is neither glory nor wealth being killed in the wilderness where not so much as the sands of the shore will tell the true story of the crime so the french merchant compromises sells out to the nor'westers at cost plus carriage and retires to the st lawrence cursing british justice it may be guessed that the sudden eruption of the peddlers these bush banty these scotch soldiers of fortune with french bullies for fighters roused the ancient and honorable hudson bay company from its half-century slumber of peace anthony hendry who had gone up the saskatchewan far as the blackfoot country of the foothills they had dismissed as a liar in the fifties because he had reported that he had seen indians on horseback whereas the sleepy factors of the bay ports knew very well they had never saw any kind of indians except indians in canoes but now in the sixties it is noted by the company that not so many furs are coming down from up country it is voted the french canadian paddlers of montreal be notified of the company's exclusive monopoly to the trade of these regions one finley is sent to quebec to look after the hudson's bay company's rights 
but while the English company talks about its rights, the Nor'westers go into the field and take them. The English company rubs its eyes and sits up and scratches its heavy head, and passes an order that Mr. Moses Norton, chief factor of Churchill, and Mr. Samuel Hearn to explore the upcountry. Hearn has heard of far away Meadow River, far enough away in all conscience from the Canadian peddlers, and thither in December 1770 he finds his way after two futile attempts to set out. Maton Abbey, great chief of the Chippewans, is his guide. Maton Abbey, who brings furs from Athabasca, is now accompanied by a regiment of wives to act as beasts of burden in the sledge traces, camp servants, and cooks. Hearn sets out in midwinter in order to reach the Coppermine River in summer, by which he can descend to the Arctic in canoes. Storm or cold, bog or rock, Metonaby keeps fast pace, so fast he reaches the great caribou traverse before provisions have dwindled and in time for the spring hunt. Here all the Indian hunters of the north gather twice a year to hunt the vast herge of caribou going to the seashore for summer. Back to the upcountry for the winter, herds in countless thousands upon thousands, such multitudes the clicking of the horns sounds like wind in a leafless forest, the tramp of the hoofs like galloping cavalry. Store of meat is laid up for Hearn's voyage by Matabee's Indians, and a band of warriors joins the expedition to go down Coppermine River. If Hearn had known Indian customs as well as he knew the fur trade, he would have known that it boded no good when Matabi ordered the women to wait for his return in the Athabasca country of the West. Absence of women on the march meant only one of two things, a war raid or hunt, and which it was soon enough Hearn learned. They had come at last on July 12, 1771, on Coppermine River, a mean little stream flowing over rocky bed in the barren lands of the little sticks, trees, when Hearn noticed, just above a cataract, the domed teepee tops of an Eskimo camp. It was night, but as bright as day in the long light of the north. Instantly, before Hearn could stop them, his Indians had stripped as for war, and fell upon the sleeping Eskimo in ruthless massacre. Men were brained as they dashed from the domed tents, women speared as they slept, children dispatched with less thought than a white man would give to killing a fly. In vain, Hearn, with tears in his eyes, begged the Indians to stop. They laughed him to scorn, and doubtless wondered where he thought they yearly got the ten thousand beaver pelts brought to Churchill. A few days later, July 17, 1771, Hearn stood on the shores of the Arctic, heaving to the tide and afloat with ice. But the horrors of the massacre had robbed him of an explorer's exultation. Though he was first of pathfinders to reach the Arctic overland, Manitonby led Hearn back to Churchill in June of 1772 by a wide westward circle through the Athabasca Bear Lake country, which the Hudson's Bay people thus discovered only a few years before the Nor'westers came. No longer dare the Hudson's Bay Company ignore the upcountry. Hearn is sent to the Saskatchewan to build Fort Cumberland, and Matthew Cocking is dispatched to the country of the Blackfeet, modern Alberta, to beat up trade, where his French voyageur, Louis Primo, deserts him bag and baggage to carry the Hudson's Bay furs off to the Nor'westers. No longer does the English company slumber on the shores of its frozen sea. Yearly are voyagers sent inland, patoons of the woods, given bounty to stay in the wilds, luring any trade from the Nor'westers. End of section 31. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.